All right, guys, welcome back to another episode of Mindful Hunter. I'm your host, as always, Jay Nickel. And this week, we've got Kevin on from Wilderness Athlete. So we've been looking at this episode for a little bit because I think it's going to give us an opportunity to dig into some supplementation and training questions that I tend to get all the time. I think Wilderness Athlete is an interesting company for a couple reasons that I hope to dig into. They have some really good formulations on, on some of their products. I really respect the way that they approach marketing, considering some other players in this space. And they're also a sister company of Outdoorsman's. And you know, if you watch my podcast, I'm a huge fan of Outdoorsman's for a lot of the same reasons. It's like not only just the quality of the product, but the integrity of the people behind the product. So I feel comfortable in assuming that fades over into the Wilderness Athlete team as well. So thank you very much for making the time today, Kevin. Really appreciate it. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks for having me on, Jay. So what I'd like to dive into your story a little bit, because I think it's going to be great to like get into wilderness athlete and see, you know, where it came from and where it's going, but you've been with them for what, almost six years now. Yeah. Yeah. About that. Um, it, the, the, the lines are, are kind of fuzzy with when, when I started, because I first started working for outdoorsmen when I moved out here to Arizona. Um, worked for outdoorsmen for about a year. And then, you know, at the time, uh, wilderness athlete was being operated out of the outdoorsmen's uh, building. And so it was kind of all hands on deck for that. And then, um, when we took it out of the outdoorsmen's into its own facility, its own team, um, I was, uh, I was kind of like employee number one that went with it. Um, okay. so it was just me and, and my boss now, Courtney Denham, who really ran the show for a while. And we slowly started building the team from there. So let's back it up a little bit. Where does your story in the outdoors starts? Do you come in through sports? Do you come in through hunting? Like where's your passion lie and how did that come about? Yeah. Yeah. It's a, I guess a bit of an uh, unconventional route, but I think in the hunting industry and the outdoor industry, it's always unconventional. Like there isn't like a degree out there, which gives you a, you know, a straight line to it. But um, I went to college for uh, environmental studies and conservation work. So I went uh, really, you know, got my hands dirty. And at the time when I got in, in college, that was the, the major I chose because it was the closest thing to keep me into the outdoors. Um, I was a, a pretty competitive uh, football and baseball player all through my life okay. through high school. And, you know, when my dreams of playing collegiately uh, kind of went away from me after a number of injuries, you know, I was like, okay, my next best, you know, strongest passion was the outdoors. So right. uh, that's what took me that direction in college. And Actually, after college, I <clears throat> I went to work for the Department of Fish and Game, and I went to school in California. So I went to I worked for the Is Department. That where you're of Fish from and... originally, California? Yeah, okay. yeah, North, Northern California. Yeah, um, and I uh, so I worked for the Department of Fish and Game there for about three years, and did a lot of different things. Um, enjoyed a lot of the work, uh, and then not so much some of the other work, and so I became a bit jaded just with with that you know route that I was kind of taking as a career path and. Um, at the time I was, uh, I was, I had my girlfriend at the time, uh, was getting into veterinary school and she got into school out here in Arizona. And I was like, you know, I kind of was looking for a change, looking for a different opportunity. And when I came out here, you know, at first I was looking for a lot of the the outdoor, I mean, like the resource management work, you know, to keep me in line with fish and game and all that. Um, but I also had like a real big interest in working in the outdoor hunting industry, um, and uh, so I put some feelers out there and, and I found a, a position in that outdoorsman that was available. And I, and I pretty much hit the ground running when I got here working for them. And it, uh, it was a great fit for me because I got to learn a lot about, you know, a lot more about the gear and industry side of the hunting world that I was always just, you know, just a, a big, you know, had a passion for, but never really worked on the inside of it. Um, and then I think I just naturally more gravitated to the wilderness athlete side because I was so inclined with just fitness and health my whole life and and sports that it was really kind of a a marriage between the two, you know, I mean, wilderness athletes really the, the perfect, uh, breed between those two of, of health, fitness, exercise, and then, you know, outdoor adventure and stuff. So it was really kind of like an aligning the stars for me in a, in a lot of ways when I kind of gravitated that direction for sure. No, that, that makes a ton of sense. So where does that put you then in the evolution of, of wilderness athlete? When did it, and I'm sure the, you know, 
they don't go from zero to hero overnight. But how long has Wilderness Athlete been in business now? Yeah, so Wilderness Athlete's been around for about 17 years now. Okay. Um, however, when uh, the people, you know, the, the, the owners group like the, that I work for, um, they, they took it over about, you know, I think eight or nine years ago, maybe, maybe more than that now, maybe 10 years ago. Um, and so it was a bit of a different team change in that regard, but we kept a lot of the same, you know, almost all of the same key players when it comes to the formulation team. Um, that's really where the, the bread and butter is, of course, with any supplement uh, company is, you know, who is helping you bring about these products. So, um, and then we still have, you know, Mark Paulson, our founder, who's still very much a part of our team. Uh, he focuses a bit more on our working athlete division these days. Um, which is a division of our company that that does B two B sales for industrial uh, industrial companies. You know, so big companies that are uh, providing their employees with uh, hydration electrolyte supplementation for you know you know construction workers, utility, uh, mining. You know, you name it. You know, um, so that's really been a, a big focus of his for the past you know five or six years. But um, that, you know, so for me, you know, where I started at the ground level with Will and his athlete, just being two of us, you know, I was, you know, Courtney and I wore a lot of hats. We shipped boxes, answered phones, um, you know, you name it, um, everything from customer service to order fulfillment. Um, but I've slowly developed more into like a marketing role. So now I'm the director of marketing, but, you know, even still, you know, our team, we operate pretty lean, you know, we don't have this, you know, a uh, huge corporate structure where everyone's pigeonholed in their position. So, you know, even now we got to wear a lot of hats when, so I, right now I'm, I'm, I'm very much involved in like our product development, um, marketing, um, growth, retail, all, all that kind of stuff. So we do have to be pretty flexible and it's, it's, I think what keeps the job so much fun and interesting. And it's what everybody, I think is what keeps everybody in our whole team passionate about it because, you know, they feel truly, uh, some ownership over the brand and the company. There's a whole lot to unpack in there. Let's just take one thing at a time. <laughs> sure. And I kind of want to, this may seem like a backwards approach, but I almost want to talk about the marketing component first, and then I'd like to get into a more technical conversation. And yeah. I'm not, anybody who listens knows I'm rather opinionated on some other brands and we don't need to get into that. But one of the things that's always really impressed me about Outdoorsman is the take on marketing. And mm -hmm. I don't want to use the term subtle in like a, a negative way, but you guys have never been that like in your face kind of brand. It's almost like you want to let the work speak for itself. Can you get into a little bit like, where does that come from? Cause there's a very clear, like brand identity that wilderness athlete has. And I got to assume, you know, maybe initially for Mark or like, was that a very clearly thought out strategy or is that just like an organic development over time that happened with the brand? Well, I think it started more as an organic development in the sense that we, the, the individuals, you know, on our marketing team, the, uh, as, as people were not in your face, egotistical, make it all about us type of people, or, you know, really the type of people that I want to over promise and under deliver, you know, I mean, the, one of the beautiful things about our, our company is that we're all, we're all wilderness athletes, you know, we all live and breathe the lifestyle. And so in a sense, we've built this thing because we try to make products that we want to use that we right. really believe in and that we want for ourselves. And then we, once we develop something that is appropriate for what we want and what we're looking to accomplish, then we share it with, you know, uh, our tribe, our customers, our people. Um, so I think it, we, we always kind of shied away from that, um, you know, flashy marketing style where there's a lot of distractions from what the actual intent of the product and what it, the intent of the company ought to be. We've always kept it pretty honest, but I think there was a, a change somewhere that was definitely more intentional where we realized, okay, we need to put more structure to that idea because we can all, we can all identify the, that how we feel about our brand, how we want our brand to feel the people. Um, but where it started to change for us was, you know, really making it about our customer. And that's where it is today is, is we don't want our marketing, um, our products, anything about our company to really be inwardly looking like, look at, look at the big badasses that are running this company and all of the hunts we get to go on, all of the things we're accomplishing. 
Um, really, what we we try to focus on is how to improve our customers' lives better uh, every day. You know, and that's really it. it Help. It makes our job a lot easier, to be honest with you. When you're faced with decisions about packaging or pricing or uh, campaigns or events or or anything, really any decision, um, sponsorships. You know, if you try to boil it down to that simple question, is how does this make our customers' lives better? Is there is there a a realistic or logical way that it does. Um, and when you can't figure that out, that it's a, it's a good sign that it's not going to really do much for your customer because our company wouldn't be anything without our customer. So, um, you know, in a sense, I think once we started with that, once we realized that, um, we, it helps build the framework of, of, of the brand voice, you know, how we, how we try to communicate with our customers. We try to be very candid and honest, you know, we know like, like the way we feel about companies that we do business with and that we buy stuff from, I like buying uh, products from from people, you know, uh, personality, not just faceless brands. And so we we've tried to we've made an attempt to you know let people into our company and our personality a bit more and let them feel you know or to help them feel like they know who who's making the products and that they can trust us. Uh, because we're not making stuff that we don't take ourselves every day and that we don't believe in wholeheartedly. So that's that's kind of where I guess the the organic side kind of became more intentional. <laughs> no, that's very interesting. And I think that's a function of growth as well. Like organic development works so long, but once the ship gets to be a certain size, if you don't have, you know, a, a guiding North Star for development that everyone is in agreement that this is the direction we're heading, the clarity kind of yeah. starts to get sacrificed. And that's interesting. I never really, you know, intentionally noted the customer facing narrative, but if you think about it, there isn't really that like charismatic symbol at wilderness athletes that some of the other uh, supplement brands gravitate around this kind of like hero figure that they elevate. And then, you know, he yeah. uses this products to get here. It is much more about like, kind of no, more normal run-of-the-mill stories and how's like average Joe dad fitting in his backpack cardio after working all day. Like that's a story I would see on the, on the Wilderness Athlete Instagram that would feel completely at home and it wouldn't yeah. stick out as like, a, you know, trying too hard or something like that. Yeah, yeah. And, and that that was probably something we scratched our heads at with for a while, which is you know, looking even just looking even beyond um, the hunting nutrition industry, looking into just general nutrition industry as a whole, which is, as you know, is, is gargantuan. Yep. It's really common to see companies that lean into that charismatic uh, figurehead, you know, and for a long time in the beginning of the Wilderness Athlete days, that, that was Mark Paulson. And right. uh, that was also a different time. You know, I think in general, people have become a lot more privy to things and more jaded with the way they're being marketed to and people don't want to be felt you know they don't want to feel sold or bought um we we um you know truly i think we want to try to we want to make our customers feel like the hero of their story we don't really want people to see all these other people that are doing something that they can't accomplish i mean i think it's a far more empowering message uh to show people that it's achievable for them too which which it is one of our bigger overarching goals you know, I think even as it, you know, extends beyond the hunting industry is just to make our, our country uh, and our world a healthier, better society. You know, we have so many things plaguing uh, people today. We see the outdoors as like one of the most critical vehicles for motivating people, even if they don't hunt, even if they've never bought a hunting license. Um, you know, being in the outdoors definitely has some intrinsic value and some power to it with with how it, you know, benefits your, your mental health, how it, uh, you know, relates to your stress level, uh, getting, being active outdoors is, is, is not exclusive to the hunter athlete. And, mm -hmm. you know, so we, we definitely have goals, you know, that even extend beyond just the hunting market. I mean, of course that's, that's our, that's our home, you know, that's who we are too, but, um, we want it to be inviting to, you know, the, the, the larger community too, but, um, yeah, so we want people to see themselves in in our brand as well. Uh, you know, the closest thing that I could say that we have uh, to more of that figurehead like type of person, like our our Remy Warren uh, and yeah. Chrissy Titus, those are probably the the biggest 
names, you know, Chris Denham and Nate Simmons. Um, these people have definitely reached like a celebrity level in the, in the hunting industry. However, their use and, and they're like family to our company. Well, look like, how long really, those guys have been. I know like, that's where the authenticity really comes through. It's like, you didn't just go pay a ass load of money to get Remy to sign last week. Remy's been with WA as long as I've been watching Remy, which has to be a decade now, at least like, yeah. um, yeah. Uh, yeah. So right. I think that's the other element is that it doesn't come through as like, we went and grabbed these big figureheads. I would even argue they weren't those big figureheads. No, at the time they weren't, the no. relationship. And it's like, they've cut, you guys have kind of grown into that together. Yeah. Yeah. Both of them, uh, worked for, I mean, did work for wilderness athlete, did promotion for years before we ever paid them a dime. We yeah. just gave them some product. And right. I mean, there was no, there was no incentive there for them because they a, were not the people that were looking for that. They weren't like these amb ambassador types that were just looking for other companies to help leverage them into a bigger spotlight. Uh, it was definitely more just an authentic appreciation for the products that we make, the people that we are, and, and I think, you know, what it brought to their health. And that's, that's the other reason why, you know, like, like what you mentioned earlier, we believe so much in the quality of our products that we just want to get it in your hands and give you a chance to try it. And if you've experienced supplementation from a lot of other companies, you'll see the difference. You'll feel, you'll feel the difference. Um, and that's, you know, to me, the most compelling, uh, you know, result or the most compelling argument you could ever have with, with yourself, you know, of course this day and age when people want to feel in the cool kids club, they want to feel identity. So, you know, maybe the reason why they use X over Y is more because their friends are using it or because they get more likes on Instagram when they post about it. Yep. Um, but I think, you know, the people that we're for the type of, the type of athletes, the type of people we're for are the people that are looking for every opportunity to just improve themselves, their health and the way they feel. Um, and that's probably the majority. I think, you know, we're looking at maybe the young 20 somethings who are still, you know, making their decisions on supplements based on hashtags. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. And I think, I think it's important. We take a quick transition because between the work athlete and then the kind of non hunting outdoor enthusiast population you mentioned. I want to share a little bit here because I think it sometimes gets lost. The hunting population has always kind of been at odds internally about recruitment because recruitment means more pressure, but we're also all well aware that if we don't have a bigger voice, we're going to lose our way of life. Um, I'm a strategy consultant by trade and I just finished a really interesting project with um, an organization in British Columbia called One Campfire. Mm. One Campfire was originally founded by the Wild Sheep Society of BC, which is a chapter of the Wild Sheep Foundation. And the Wild Sheep Foundation is one of the largest funders of One Campfire. And One Campfire has a very interesting mission statement. And that is to impact the sentiment of the non-hunting outdoor enthusiast, to just be more open to hunting as a lifestyle which I, I got really excited about because if you look at the numbers, like what are we across North America? Maybe 5%, let's just say people hunt. Changing that to six is, a, is an overwhelming task. But if we were able to take 1% of the other 95% and just have them move from here to here on their sentiment towards hunting, that is a huge shift. So I think it really behooves us to go out of our way to create opportunities to generate cooperation. Cause you're right, man. I don't care if you're going on a hike. I don't care if you're going on an overnight backpack trip, or if you are going hunting, spending time out in the wilderness helps you understand and maybe relate more to people who like, especially cause we're going to get into this later. My passion is backcountry hunting and solo for the most part. I mm -hmm. like getting out by myself in the wilderness. And I don't care if you're a, a mountain climber or a mountain biker or a kayaker, like you're going to understand what it is about that, that I love. Maybe the taking the life of an animal might present some difficulty, but once we have an intelligent conversation and you understand like sourcing your own protein and all that kind of stuff, like, so I just think it's important for the audience to understand that even at first it might look like, um, a pivot or not aiming at your, you know, core demo. I think that in the long run, it, it actually directly benefits us as hunters to have brands like yourself kind of warming up 
the the foyer for these like non hunting yeah. individuals to just be welcome in the space, even if they don't hunt. Yeah, yeah, no, absolutely. That's it, so. I mean, you know, we are definitely still that that hook and bullet company, but I think it's uh, it's it's like it's to your disservice if you shut out opportunities people who are appreciating the outdoors, uh, similar to, similarly to how, to how you do. Um, because like, as you said, like we, you know, like I, we've got a CrossFit gym here, like right across the street. And there's a lot of members there who like almost, almost none of them hunt, but they know that all of the people here from Wilderness South that are all pretty big hunters. We bring wild game to, you know, gym parties and stuff all the time, but we've definitely shifted a lot of people's way of thinking about hunting. Uh, n- not because they had this like anti view of it, but because they see the dedication and the appreciation we have for the lifestyle, um, you know, because a lot of them are, are, I would consider outdoorsmen too. They, they, they run outdoors, they hike, they camp They're you know, in Arizona, a lot of people are really, you know, get outdoors a lot. Um, so it, it is like, I think there's a lot more similarities and common ground between, you know, the, the non hunters and the hunters and, you know, like the mission of one campfire, I think is definitely, I think it's a great, it's a great, uh, objective because, you know, there's a lot of people who don't consider themselves hunters, but they, they don't necessarily consider themselves anti-hunters either. They're just not exactly. informed. They're just, they don't have opinions formed based on facts or experience. Um, and in my experiences, communicating with family, friends, or things like that, most of the adverse feelings towards what I do for fun, uh, comes from just a lack of understanding completely. 100%. You know, there's so it's crazy. I remember a conversation I had years ago with a woman who didn't realize she had no idea uh, the concept of seasons or tags. Right. She thought if you're a hunter, you could pretty much take a gun and any time and any place and shoot anything you wanted. And, you know, I mean, if I'm, am I, if I'm in her shoes, like, yeah, that does seem pretty like barbaric and yeah. seem pretty irresponsible. So, you know, it was hard to have like hard feelings towards her because she just wasn't informed. Um, but, you know, like, I guess getting to like the working athlete thing that, that was really, so the, the beauty of that is that it's still, we're, we're, we're approaching and marketing and, and dealing and working for the blue collar workforce of, of our country. Yeah. Uh, the men and women who make our infrastructure possible. Um, a lot of them tend to be hunters as well. And, and in many cases, the, the way we kind of got ushered into that space was because there was a lot of guys on the job site that, that do hunt, that knew us and experienced us from hunting, uh, using hydrate and recover specifically. Yeah. And then they would feel so good and, and, and strong and limitless in terms of like their endurance and hydration level in the field. Then they'd go back to work on Monday and the job site gives them squencher or Gatorade and it made them feel like shit. It tastes like shit. And, uh, it wasn't, doing anything for them to limit their heat related, uh, heat, you know, heat stroke, you know, fatigue, any of that. And so there were still all sorts of accidents, injuries, deaths happening because of it. Um, and so that's kind of where the opportunity became more apparent that we can make a bigger difference in, in a, in a bigger sense with our, with our product than just, just pinpointing the hunting market, because, you know, as you know, like the blue collar workforce is, is incredibly important to just the life that we live. Um, so yeah, that, that's kind of where that, that came that, that it really wasn't like a, Oh, Hey, let's just branch off. And that made sense. It was really kind of an organic, uh, opportunity. See, I think it's such a great fit. So when I did my first degree, I tree planted in the summers, which up here in Canada is a great thing to do. You can make a buttload of money going to the bush for three months and it's insanely physical. It's piecework. So you get paid per tree. So you kind of make it as physical as you want. But for people who are particularly driven, like I could go into the woods for three months, make 20 grand, 20 grand, take August off and go back to university with a nice paycheck in my pocket. But it was more of a sport than a job. And I think if you actually took an objective appraisal of most blue collar jobs and look at caloric expenditure as a function of time, you would find that they're closer to a sport than most people's oh. job. And, and people haven't, because I remember my first year, it was like cans of Coke and oranges. Like that was yeah. all like all day, just trying to keep the calories up. And when I went back the second year, my kind of background is in bodybuilding most specifically, but I was a CrossFit athlete. I was a jujitsu athlete. 
So when I went back to second year, I was like, this needs to be treated like a mini marathon every single day. Yeah. And I need to look at my, my calories, my hydration, all as a function of how can I increase peak performance? And same thing. I was more concerned about making more money, but the same factors are at play if you're looking at increasing cognitive awareness, uh, decreasing safety risks, like all those things are a function of, of proper nutrition, proper supplementation and proper hydration. So I think it's a perfectly natural segue for the business. And one that's probably, probably being met with more, like that's the thing about big safety councils. If you can even show like a one to 2% reduction in things. There's so much money to be saved there for those large organizations Yeah, that I, I, I bet you there's quite a lot of support for this in the industry. Oh, it is. It, you, you actually hit it, the nail on the head when it, when it comes to, you know, the, the work, the physical labor that most of these men and women do rivals what a professional athlete does. And in, in most circumstances, it far exceeds it. You know, there was a statistic and I, and I, I'm kind of fuzzy on the numbers, but we have it in a video that we made for working athlete, um, which calculates like the average amount of time that a professional football player spends on the field actually working, you know, and then the average amount of time that, uh, I think it was a construction worker or, or a lineman spends working far more hours a day, far more calories. It's a, it's a way more, uh, energy intensive job because like there's not just physical demand there's cognitive function there too um and you know when we bring presentations to these guys these men and women and we address them as working athletes you know that's how we're trying to communicate with them because they are you know the the jobs they do are incredibly strenuous and the the risks are far greater usually than you know being on a basketball court you know uh you're not going to twist your ankle or break an arm you could you could die in in a lot of circumstances if you make a lapse in judgment because you haven't taken care of yourself if you haven't stayed properly hydrated if you didn't you know you know get the right sleep the night before if you're not feeling yourself properly so yeah it's been welcomed with open arms and to your point um you know the companies as well have in the last you know, five to 10 years, it seems have taken a much harder look at the way they're taking care of their employees because it is their most valuable asset. And, um, when they have injuries or problems in the job site, it's, it's very expensive. And so there's a lot more workplace culture, uh, changes going on with, they want to see their employees. There's a lot more investment into the health of their employees culture. And, and that's where we come in because we're not just giving them hydrate recover. We're trying to get them to really adopt the whole lifestyle of just being a healthier uh, a person. And, and we're, you know, it, it's the type of thing that takes a lot of upfront work, but it's been, it's been growing really uh, well for us and we're making a big difference. So yeah, I could, we couldn't be more excited about it. No, I, I think it's great. Okay. Yeah. I think we could talk about a whole bunch of stuff uh, yeah, for a lot longer, but if I don't mm-hmm. get into some technical discussion, I'm going to have a lot of pissed off listeners. So sure. here was my thoughts. Cause I'd like to talk formulation. I'd like to dig into some of the products. And I think there's two vehicles we can use to do that training mm-hmm. and a hunt. Cause okay. I think they have different supplement needs, um, or at least different protocols might be the same base products, but you would use them in a, in a different way. So I was almost thinking like, what is ideal peri workout nutrition look like for an average guy, 40 something works all day, tries to go get in his, his backpack cardio. Yeah. Um, and that would be another interesting topic that we could get into as well. Like what is a good basic training protocol? I know how I have my own thoughts, but I'd like to hear yours as well. And then the second part of the conversation, I'd like to take like a 10 day hunt and say, what would, you know, the supplementation needs look like yeah. of course for a 10 day hunt. So, yeah. So let's start with the training. What are your, what are your thoughts? Sure. So let's just get into it. Oh, well, I guess in training modalities, and, and I can really speak more more from just my own uh, my own approach and the results that I've seen and the things that I've I've shifted, and and also from speaking with customers because you know training has become so uh, specific to. There's a lot of ways to train. There's a lot of I think different approaches to it. One of the things that I believe the most in, and and not even just training for hunts, but like training for you know, long distance hikes or runs that I'll do. I think the most important thing is training how you're going to to play, you know, for a lack of a better phrase, you're going to spend a lot of time with the backpack on your shoulders, climbing mountains, 
um, living, you know, living with your life on your, in your pack, you need to do a lot of training with a backpack on. You need to get comfortable with that. Love um, it. You're preaching to the choir. Yeah. Yeah. It, so, and I think, you know, I lean more towards the the CrossFit. I'm in the CrossFit gym every day. Yep. And the, I think the beauty of that is it does, I think, have more functional, um, you know, utility than, than a lot of other Globo gym style of workouts or just running sure. or just doing jujitsu or just doing one thing. You know, I feel the beauty of CrossFit is it brings a lot of things into it, but in and of itself, it's not enough, you know, because you rarely ever throw a backpack on. Um, and that changes the game for a lot of people. So like for me, when I have, you know, a five to seven day backpack hunt coming up, I just get my ass on the trail as much as I can with a backpack on between, you know, 40 and 70 pounds and just put in miles, you know, build the strength of my feet, my ankles, my knees, my legs, and get my core and back, just my mind, my mind body connection used to feeling that weight on my shoulders and my hips. Um, I think that's, that's critical. You know, um, it, I think, it, you know, we look at a lot of circumstances where we hear customers, <clears throat> man, I got an elk tag or I got a sheep tag in a month or two months and I need to drop a bunch of weight. What do I do? And, you know, that I think starting from that is a pretty poor place to start from because yeah. we're huge proponents of it's, it's much easier to just stay in shape and stay, you know, maintain a certain level of health and conditioning throughout the year than, than do this yo-yo thing every year. Um, but you know, I think a lot of times we see people get too fixated on losing weight. You know, I want to drop 10, 12, 15 pounds and they become fixated on the number they see on the scale. Yep. And we are firm believers in the concept of muscle management, um, especially as you age, because, you know, the declining, uh, the, the data shows that the declining health is, is mostly tied to the decline in, in a valuable or viable muscle as you age. So, you know, if some guy has a hunt in a month and he wants to lose 10 pounds, I'd almost rather him spend more time focusing on strengthening his legs and, and yep. strength and being stronger than just losing weight. Cause right. I've seen it before where guys, they do lose that weight. They lose that 10, 20 pounds they wanted to lose, but they've lost a lot of it in muscle and they feel like a shadow of themselves when it comes time to throw that heavy pack on and, and cover ground. Um, and that's, you know, I think, but that's kind of, you know, I might have a different answer when it comes to, okay, it's, it's January and I, you know, yeah, lose weight lighter is faster, lighter lives longer. Um, but you know, in a short context, when, when people are kind of in a mad dash to, to make a, a rush for being in better shape before a hunt, I think feeling strong and feeling in condition is, is more valuable than just being less, you know, less heavy. Um, because in a short time period, the weight you lose typically isn't all that meaningful. And if you're not strong enough to carry it around, then it's not a huge benefit to you anyways to lose four or five pounds. No, I, I couldn't agree more. And it, so I'm 42 and it really hit me on my, I did a solo goat hunt in February, easily the most difficult physical hunt I've ever done in my life. And I've always been the guy where I'm like in decent shape all year, I lift four or five days a week. And I would normally like six to eight weeks out of a hunt, just start that cardio grind, that backpack cardio grind. And that was what I did for the goat hunt. And I didn't hit the trailhead the way I wanted to hit the trailhead. Now I got it done just based on pure grit. And I realized, oh, I've passed that line where I can like cram for the exam. Like metabolically, the shit just yeah. don't, don't work <laughs> like that anymore. Yeah. And so I've got a big two week sheep hunt coming up in August. And I made myself a promise after the goat hunt. It was like, I've got this trail. It's about a 20 minute drive from my house. It's an hour and a half round trip, thousand foot in elevation, 500 stairs and four kilometers round trip. And I do that with, um, another 45 pound plate on my Atlas trainer. And I promised myself twice a week, every week. And I've kept that promise. Haven't missed a, a week yet. And I think that's going to be my, <sighs> kind of like theme now that I'm hitting my, my mid forties is like that staying in shape all year is such a better strategy than trying to get in shape. Because I do agree too. any, anything, the body does not like to adapt to things quickly. And if you force it, it's going to force back on you a compromise through sacrificing something. 
And yeah. that's going to mean dumping glycogen, dumping lean tissue. If you're um, in a caloric deficit, it's going to catabolize muscle tissue because that's the easiest attainable source of protein for the body. And yeah, you're going to watch the scale go down and you're going to show up weak and depleted for your hunt. Couldn't agree yeah. more. I've actually started taking on the opposite where I'll actually go pretty hardcore on, on calories the week before a hunt. Like mm -hmm. not get sloppy, but like I'll yeah. actually eat up. I'm hoping yep. to hit the trailhead with like a couple of pounds of fluff. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Same way. That's yeah. going to be gone, man. Like by, by day three, right. I'm going to be a mess. So I really love that. So, okay. So let's focus on this guy who is yeah. a month and a half out and wants to build strength because I do find the Perry workout nutrition, whether or not you want to gain weight or lose weight would depend on carb timing and all the rest. So let's, let's make it even more simpler. This guy, he's, he's two months out from his sheep hunt. He's going to be doing backpack cardio a couple times a week. What kind of things should he be thinking about pre during and post training for supplementation? Um, yeah, one of the things that I'm a big proponent of, um, probably mainly because I I've always been plagued with just, I've had joint injuries almost my whole life. Um, specifically my shoulders since the early days of playing football, I've had a number of dislocations and, um, I think joint injuries in general are, are probably one of the most common things that slows people down. Um, so I'm always, I mean, we, we, I, I like to focus a lot on recovery. Okay. It's, you know, um, it can definitely be sexy and easy to gravitate to the, the high octane pre-workouts, the, you know, BCAAs that give you, you know, more reps in the gym and that's all good and well, but you can only train as hard as you recover truthfully, because if you really want to get somewhere and you really want to make some gains and results, you need consistency, which means multiple days in the gym, pushing it, not doing the same thing, but multiple days of getting outside of your comfort zone. Um, so I think a lot of times people, especially when they're younger, and I was this way when I was in high school and college too, I didn't really think too much about recovery. I focused more on the type of pre-workout I was drinking, the intra, you know, workout BCAA that I was drinking. Uh, I just wanted to feel jacked up. And when you're young too, everything feels good. You know, yeah. it's, it's hard to really, uh, feel too sore, too, too lame to do anything. So, but, you know, honestly, I think focusing on recovery. So, you know, one of the things that I'm a big proponent of is a, com a combination of a fish oil and a glucosamine supplement. Um, so fish oil, which has this extremely long list of health benefits, you know, from hair, skin and nails, which I think most women are familiar with, but has a really big tie to the synovial fluid, uh, you know, like production, the, the health of synovial fluids in your joints, which just helps, you know, the, the lubrication and movement of your joints. Uh, same with like, for instance, like our, our joint supplement, we use glucosamine and MSM, uh, MSM is directly tied to more synovial fluid production. So they work really synergistically together, um, to lower inflammation. Um, that's one of the other main effects of, of omega-3 fatty acids is, is lowering inflammation. Um, and I think that's key to understand too, is, you know, joint inflammation, inflammation as a whole isn't really bad. Like inflammation is a good thing. It's your body's response, uh, to create fluid and to bring nutrients and, and liquid and, and stuff to an area where there has been micro traumas, micro tears and, and stress, um, where inflammation it be, be, becomes a bad word is when it's chronic and it's causing you pain and it's limiting mobility. Um, and that's when most people start to pay attention to it is when it becomes a bad thing. Um, so those two products right there are like key on a daily basis. And that's not necessarily post-workout, but that's just like every day, you know, yeah. um, you're taking your fish and your joint uh, supplementation. Um, a high quality protein shake is, is a must, especially post-workout. Um, I'm a big believer in creatine. I think a lot of people, there's a lot of misinformation out there about creatine and usually because there's an overabundance of it in certain products. Um, the data that we base our creatine use on, uh, from a lot of really, uh, hard hitting clinical research shows that between three and a half and five grams consumed post-workout is definitely the, 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 the way to maximize the benefit of it. You know, I think exceeding that, um, you start to see some of the things that people don't love, the puffy lack of definition, the bloatedness, and per perhaps some of the dehydration symptoms that people feel when their cells are too volumized with water. And maybe that water isn't, you know, present in enough of the muscle tissues where it's needed. But, um, 
So a little bit of creatine, I think is a great thing. It definitely helps with recovery as well, because essentially what it does is it just helps your cells hang on to more water a bit and a, and a, a hydrated cell is a healthy cell in a, in a simple context. So, um, that's definitely something in, in hydration is, is really key. I mean, our whole company is pretty much built around hydration. I think also because, you know, hydrate recover is like our flagship product. Um, but because it is so vital to not just recovery, but performance, uh, mental performance, um, it is, it is critical in terms of how you are going to perform, uh, not just in that moment, but you know, how you can perform for the next few days. Um, when you're, when you even have like a really minor, uh, a really minor level of dehydration, it has a pretty steep impact on your physical capacity for, uh, cardiovascular strength and, and muscular strength too. So, you know, pre-workouts, you know, I, I don't know. I think pre-workouts, there's a, there's a lot of, basically I, what I look for in a pre-workout is something that gives me the energy to get in there and, and push the limit and gives me the amino acids that, that my body is going to respond to, to feel, uh, a bit of an uptick in blood flow, um, some vasodilation, but, you know, I think, you know, really one of the things that pre-workouts do most for us is it gives us the energy, the motivation, and it kind of helps us flip that mental trigger as to, okay, now I'm going to go train. I'm going to go hit the weights and I'm going to be in a bit of a different mental space than I have been for the rest of the day. There's a lot of ways to do it. Um, even, you know, we make a, a non-caffeinated pre-workout because a lot of us work out at night. Um, and we're making another one uh, pretty soon here, but, um, yeah. So I think for the, for the guy looking for, okay, I got two months out. Um, I, I would assume that guy knows he needs to train his ass off for the next two months. He needs to be pretty dedicated to that routine. But I think almost equally as important to being dedicated to that routine is recovering properly because if he doesn't, uh, create that momentum in his body to recover and have, have, you know, lowered inflammation, healthy tissues, healthy joints, healthy muscles. Um, you know, at the end of that two months, when it's time to climb the mountain, you might feel pretty trashed. So that's, I guess, in a long <laughs> winded way, that's kind of how my, my approach would be. No, that's, that's perfect, man. Um, and we're going to kind of dig a little bit deeper into hydration on the, on the backpack stuff too. And I appreciate yeah. the focus on recovery because it is not, you know, I'm still a meathead at heart and I, I yeah, do a much better it. job at like pushing forward than like stop and, and, and I've even taken it, my, my, my new theme for hunts even is like go easy on the first day. Cause I can't tell you how many times I've driven myself into a hole on day one and it takes me two or three days to get out of it because, you know, I hike in 16 miles or some crazy shit. And it's just like, it wasn't necessary. You could have stopped at 10. It didn't matter if it was four o'clock in the afternoon. And so this like going slower to go further approach is something that as I'm getting older, I'm trying to focus on more as well. And I've, so let's have, before we get into the backcountry stuff, let's actually have a functional conversation about hydration because it has something that has plagued me. So, and I've talked about this before. So the kind of the vastus medialis or the teardrop portion of the quad. And it's funny because I've heard this from other people as well. Like it is chronic cramping area for me, especially downhill heavy pack. And I've had several hunts where it like took me out. Like I had to stop yeah. walking. I had to grab a rock or a stick or my thumb and I had to like dig in there and break those up. And it's got to the point now where, and I normally use some type of electrolyte product in my camel pack just so that I'm getting something, but uh, like, you know what it's like in the high country, man, like water is a sparse commodity. And sometimes you don't want to walk down 2000 feet to go fill yeah. it back up and you don't drink enough, which is where I think the importance of having like you're saying, a proper amino acid profile, a proper electrolyte blend in the water that we do drink. Because if you're not getting enough, then what's in it almost, it becomes even more important yeah. then. Because if you could just drink 10, 10 liters of water a day, you could, you've got a lot more kind of flexibility there with what's in the water. So let's have a conversation about like, what does that ideal hydration profile look like? Yeah. Um, so I guess to your point real quick with the cramping issue, 
it's one of the more frustrating things out there because you know modern science has a lot of things figured out we're incredibly brilliant on a lot of fronts but for some reason there has not been a pinpointed cause for muscle cramps because yeah. it's a it's a myriad of things and it can be so individualistic um it's a reflection of a lot of things in your diet um it's the many different electrolytes and the way those play a part in in you know nerve communication and muscle firing and stuff so it's hard to create this hydration product or like th this cramp cure. But I will say, um, I will say we used to do Spartan races a few years ago and we began, I mean, we would see thousands of hundreds of uh, thousands of people over a week, a weekend and muscle cramps is so, so freaking common because people are running, they're pushing themselves way beyond their limits and they would have hydrant recover. And it's the only thing that would cure their cramps. And we hear it every year, like, hundreds of times a year from guys that have chronic muscle cramping and hydrant recovery is the only thing that makes a difference for them. Um, so much so that we, when we go to events, when we go to trade shows, we usually put up a sign that says, you know, got cramps because it makes a big difference and it plagues so many people. Um, I think one of the causes and one of the reasons why our product is so impactful um, on muscle cramps and one of the things that ours, our hydrant recover differs with that other products don't is the ratio of magnesium and sodium, um, potassium and sodium as well. Um, many, many products out there really, um, they're overly sugared. We know that, you know, I think it's no mystery that Gatorade and a lot of those things have 24, 20 some odd plus grams of sugar. Um, but what they also do is they just, they lean heavily on sodium, you know, because almost everyone realizes that sodium is an electrolyte, but they don't understand the role of potassium or magnesium and how that counterbalances some of the vasoconstriction uh, role that sodium has. And a balance is really critical. Um, so we have, you know, 125 milligrams of, of sodium, 100 milligrams of potassium, uh, 400 milligrams of magnesium. It, magnesium's void in most hydration drinks out there. Um, and magnesium is, is very, um, good for blood vessel health, relaxing blood vessels, lowering, uh, blood pressure. And, you know, again, not knowing exactly what the reason might be for one specific person's muscle cramps. I think when you can attack, uh, your body's needs for hydration on all fronts, you have a much, you know, better chance of, of reducing the chance of cramps. Um, the other reason that I think our product makes a big difference with cramps. So we do have some sugar. We use five grams of uh, sugar and it's a, it's a really moderate amount of sugar, very low, but it's intentional. Um, so there's a process called active transport, which that amount of sugar really keys in on when you are able to create a minor or a relatively small um, insulin response. Yeah. Um, you are able to move things quicker from your bloodstream into your, you know, from your, from your intestines into your bloodstream. There is a bit of a, a escalated absorption rate when you do have a minor, uh, insulin response. So the, the, the rate at which our product is able to actually go to work and get dispersed into your muscles and into your tissues, I think is, is far more rapid than what most products are capable of. Um, when your body has a lot of sugars and carbs to process, um, there's a lot of different things being shot through the blood system when you have a huge insulin spike. So, um, that, I think that is where one of our biggest, you know, separators is, is when it comes to how it helps you with cramping. Um, on the other side, some ingredients that we use in hydrant recover, which a lot of companies, which, which almost no companies use. And we use in a lot of different products is our complex of adaptogenic herbs. We use a uh, pretty key like Shisandra extract, golden root extract. Um, those have a lot of different adaptogenic properties by, you know, in a number of different ways. Like it's kind of hard sometimes to describe what an adaptogen is, but it helps your body adapt to stress. You know, they're typically really high in antioxidants um, and they do lower inflammation. They, they, they have been shown clinically to, to help reduce heat stress. Um, so those are always present. I mean, those are present in our hydrate and recover as well, which I think also plays a role into the, the physical side of it. Um, with hydrate and recover specifically our product, uh, we use a small amount of branched chain amino acids. Um, I think a lot of people look at our 
supplement facts. I'm like, why do you only use that? We don't, we don't have like five grams or seven grams, like a true BCAA does. Right. We do use a little bit of it though, because it does help, um, ignite a little bit of protein synthesis, uh, when it comes to, you know, recovering after strenuous exercise. Right. And that's what we're after. You know, I mean, there's no macros present in this thing. There's no proteins present in this thing. There's not like a ton of branch chain amino acids. This isn't the intent of the product, but, um, you know, if you're consuming a well-rounded diet and you're giving yourself a proper nutrition to recover, that little bit of BCAAs is going to help elevate the performance of what you're consuming elsewhere too. Um, so, you know, hydration, uh, in, you know, we also, another thing that we use too is, is coenzyme Q10, which, you know, I think a lot of people don't, uh, totally, I mean, I think people kind of become more familiar with it lately. I, I see it's kind of a, a buzz product. You see it at Costco a lot. Um, but CoQ10 is, is one of the most critical, um, enzymes that, that is useful in, you know, your, your organs in producing energy. So when you're able to kind of help your body produce the, the energy it needs, um, I think it, it, it doesn't, you don't have as high of requirements elsewhere in your diet too, to, to produce that energy. That, that helps a lot, man. And that's going to be a lot of, of, you know, food to chew on for the listeners. Yeah, exactly. and, and I, I appreciate that because it is hydration is a more complicated topic than just getting enough water. And I think the further you push yourself, the more important that conversation becomes. You, you can actually even go too far the opposite way. Like if you were to drink nothing but distilled water for three days, you can be yeah. your damage yeah, um, to yeah. yourself. Yeah. So, so people mm -hmm. need to understand that as well, because you can, you know, if you drive all the, all the sodium out of your system and then start chugging gallons of water, that's going to have some negative impacts as well. Okay. I want to be cognizant of your time. I want to get into this backcountry hunting thing, but I yeah. also realize we're getting pretty close to time. How are you doing? Oh, I got, I got plenty of time, man. Okay. Awesome. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So let's set the context here. So <laughs> we're going to go on a 10 day hunt. Typical. We're going to do like, um, you know, 3,200 calories a day, pretty balanced macros, couple of pounds of food, your typical, like maybe a green belly meal for lunch, uh, some type of peak refuel or dehydrated meal for, for dinner, um, cu couple different snacks and stuff throughout the day. Now, how should somebody be thinking about, because I think what people need to understand is you're already starting the race a little bit behind because as much as you try to cram a a, a, an appropriate nutrient profile into these condensed backpacking foods. You're already a little bit behind the eight ball because you're not sitting at home eating two cups of broccoli and a fresh yeah. steak every night that would be providing you with a, a well-balanced vitamin and mineral nutrient profile. So how should somebody yeah. look at that? Like what are some of the supplement needs they're going to have? And what are some of the ways to take care of that? Yeah. Um, so like when I, when I'm planning and I, and I get kind of anal when I'm planning on my meal list, it's, it's typically like the most fun part of my whole gear list. I mean, people listening though, like when you go on a multi-day backpacking hunt, that's half the fun is prepping all your gear, weighing all your stuff. But like when I get to like planning my meal and nutrition side, it, it becomes a little obsessive, you know, considering the calories and the breakdown of your macros that you're having every day. Um, and I always like it. And I think it's an opportunity. People should think of it as an opportunity to really build another understanding of how your body relates to food, how it responds to food. And so you start to have a much healthier relationship with, okay, this in gets that out of right. me. Um, and so for me, you know, especially because I, I take, you know, take quite a bit of supplements on a daily basis, you know, it always has, it always, I think the first few years I, I started doing uh, real you know, backpack hunts, I didn't really consider the type of supplementation I should bring with me. And then I kind of thought, man, why do I feel like shit? And it's like, okay, wait a second. Like I, on a, on a daily basis, I give myself, you know, a multivitamin, a good probiotic, you know, I take care of my joint inflammation stuff. I get the right protein or hydration in my system every day. But when I go through this week, when I have like the highest demands on my body that I've been experienced all year, I kind of leave all that stuff aside and I just try to live on jerky and nuts. Yeah. Um, and that's where I think the, it kind of is a game changer for me. 
Um, and I, I explain this to people and it, I think it makes sense to a lot of people in, in, for the context of why like a high performance, a high quality multivitamin is really yeah. critical in the back country. Um, you know, a lot of us are eating dehydrated foods. And if you're looking at like freeze dried foods, um, you know, freeze dried foods have even more bioavailable nutrients, uh, sucked out of them than a, than a, than a freeze dried, than a, a dehydrated meal. Um, but you know, the bars we're eating, the, the other snacks we're eating typically don't have the, the profile that you would expect to see, um, nutritionally from your micronutrients, your vitamins, your minerals. Um, and that all has such a huge impact in your energy levels. You know, our, all the energy mechanisms, energy producing mechanisms in your body rely on those micronutrients to get those cofactors working properly. So you know, we take the bars, the dehydrated, the freeze dried fields, uh, fuels, because that's what's most practical and efficient. But, you know, I think it's really reasonable and it makes a big difference to take some multivitamin with you um, to fill in those gaps that are there. You know, hopefully when your daily life is happening, you're eating the right veggies and stuff to get those. But, you know, typically those gaps get pretty wide when you're living in the backcountry for, you know, five, seven days. Um, and it just helps you feel a hell of a lot better, man. I mean, it's just, it's really breaks down to that. Um, I always take a probiotic too, because one of the earliest backpacking experiences I ever had, I was constipated for damn near like, I don't know, three days to the point where it was like concerning, you know, and, yeah. uh, when you're eating a diet way out of the norm, that's a pretty common thing to happen. Mm -hmm. A probiotic will definitely help keep your, your bowels and your, your bowel movements more regular. And it helps, you know, that whole process happen a lot smoother. Um, that helps me feel a lot better. Um, one of the things that I'm a huge believer of, and not just for backcountry hunts, but, you know, I just did the Grand Canyon Rim Rim to Rim uh, a few weeks ago, and I drank probably five meal replacement shakes during the course of that day. Um, and I always, on a backcountry hunt, take, you know, at least, at least one for every day, sometimes two for every day. Um, you know, so our meal replacement shake is 200 calories per serving. We know that the human body can only metabolize uh, between two and 300 calories uh, an hour. Um, and when you're in the back country, time is usually, you know, uh, precious and you're looking for convenient, lightweight things that don't take up much space or weight. Um, just a, a few little baggies of a meal replacement shake um, that has a good amount of protein, fiber, which, you know, fiber is typically not present in a lot of the backpacking like snacks it is in the meals but not in the snacks um and it's just a really good a full meal um just add a little water and you feel so much rejuvenated energy especially when your body needs it yep um so i rely pretty heavily on on those um but you know and then i think that the other thing for sure for me is is our mct powder that that comes right. with me everywhere it's kind of my lifeblood just as I, I, I eat a pretty high fat diet and try to try to, you know, I, I wouldn't say I'm a keto guy at all, but I do lean more towards a high fat carb restricted diet. Um, and that, you know, ebbs and flows, but you know, when you're just a, as a weight saving, you know, energy efficient standpoint in the back country, high fat foods, um, and having like something like an MCT powder to add some fat to a shake or your coffee or your oatmeal, um, is, is, uh, invaluable. You know, to me, you know, it, when you look at the amount of calories you get, uh, per gram and the amount of, uh, you know, energy you get from just a small amount of, of fat, it's pretty, um, vital for me. Yeah, I, I'd agree. And I have some pretty strong opinions, um, on the use of carbs in the back country because the whole keto in the back country kick kind of frustrates me to a certain degree because of the lack of education people have going into it. I mm -hmm. think there's definitely a place for high fat and ketogenic diets. And if you are ketogenically adapted and you want yeah. to go into the back country with a keto diet, all power to you. I think it's fantastic. If you're not, and you try that, you're going to have a rude awakening. Yeah. But I will not argue that you're talking nine calories per gram for a fat versus four mm -hmm. calories per gram. So if we're going to be counting ounces, Mm -hmm. getting that fat content up and having something that is as bioavailable and as convenient yeah. as an MCT powder. The other thing that, uh, I did was those a uh, couple single serve packets of coconut oil. 
and yeah. you just squish those into your mountain house at night. Mm-hmm. And it's just like a free hundred calories. Doesn't even use yeah. next to nothing, even makes the meal a little bit, a little bit nicer. Mm-hmm. I really went above and beyond for the goat hunt this year because I kind of had committed the same errors that you did and that my daily supplementation was quite high. Uh, and then I would go on a backpack hunt and it's just like, Oh, whatever I need to survive. And so this year I got all these different size, little Ziploc baggies off of, uh, uh, Amazon. And I took three packs or four packs per day. One was my meal replacement protein. And I would pack one to two of those per day. The second one was a little baggie full of, um, pills, primarily a multivitamin and probably three or four high potency, um, omega three pills. And then the other two I brought, I brought a green supplement, which I'd never brought before. And I brought a a fiber supplement, which I'd also never brought before. And I think the addition of that fiber and the greens made such a difference a to my like regularity and consistency. Like it was just fantastic, like great bowel movements, no problems. Um, I think my energy levels were higher. And I think too, you're lacking that there's no fresh fruit and veg. Out yeah, there, you know, and we can eat dried fruits and and everything is all well and good, but they just don't have the same nutrient profile. Yeah, as, as the fresh stuff. So I, yeah, I I couldn't agree more. I feel very strongly that there's um there's a lot of benefit to be had by just taking a little bit of time and thinking, okay, my nutritional kind of you know needs have been satisfied through what's in this bag of food, but, but are, or your vitamins and minerals and things that you need to facilitate like all the yeah. performance and the metabolic yeah. process throughout the day. Have those been satisfied? Cause if you've got the big little blocks, big building blocks, but no little building blocks, you're going to, you're going to run into trouble because those metabolic, those metabolic processes aren't going to be able to execute the way that they are, that they're yeah. supposed to. Yeah. Like the, the meals will keep you alive, you know, like it got all the, the, the macros, the nuts and bolts to keep you alive, but you want to, you don't want to just be, you know, idling by up there. You want to kick an ass. You need to be sharp. You need to be going. Um, and that's, you know, that's, that's the name of the game, but like, to your point with the high fat thing, I, I couldn't agree more. And I, and I always, you know, I always bring, like, I, I consider myself fairly fat adapted where I've been doing it long enough where I can, really cut out carbs and, and, and lean more on fat and, and, and be okay. Uh, but if you haven't really gone through that and you haven't given that time, then you're going to feel like shit. And, but even, even with, I feel like how I am, um, I still bring some things to help me, you know, avoid bonking some really high carb, like some gel or some really like something really high, like maltodextrin or just some really high, you know, something to really kick me in the glycogen stores uh, to get you bounced back, you know, um, uh, that's important too, uh, for sure. Awesome. Okay. So I want to be cognizant of your time. Let's take a minute and just discuss a few of the more innovative products you guys have recently brought to market, because I think everything that we've talked about today, although I might argue the formulations aren't as good or they're lacking this, or they've got that and you don't have this, an analog of everything that we've talked about is kind of available. Um, and has been available for quite some time, but but some of the more interesting stuff um, you guys have brought to market recently, I would argue is more innovative, and, and maybe there aren't analogs of that currently out. So I, I'd love to just hear a little bit about, yeah, the kind of um, intention behind those and what we can expect in regards to performance and how they should be looked at and you know, I'm talking about sure. the Addies and the unplug yeah, and I sure. think there's one or two others, but yeah, if you could just sure, sure. kind of share on those for a bit. Yeah. Like, so like what you're, the products you're describing, uh, Addies, unplug edge, those are all what we call part of our mastermind line. So they're all nootropics. Um, I think, you know, nootropics have been pretty hot lately. And I think yeah. honestly, like Joe Rogan and I was going to say, Alpha you can Brain. thank Joe for that one. Yeah. Yeah. Joe Rogan and alpha brain really put put those on the, on the radar for most people. Um, and we, we looked at that product when we started to want to develop some, a sleep aid, you know, we get a lot of people who struggle with sleep, not just on a daily basis, but in the back country. Yeah, uh, but we wanted to avoid using melatonin. You know, we wanted to avoid, uh, really hindering your own ability to produce some of those critical sleep mechanisms. Um, but still foster the right conditions in the mind to get, you know, true quality, 
uh, deep, you know, restless sleep. Um, so unplug, um, look, one of the unique things about the three products is they, they are formulated to feed off of each other in, in a context, in a lifestyle sense. So unplug is your sleep aid. Uh, edge is your energy. Uh, it's more of your true, uh, I guess, more of your traditional nootropic where it really helps with mental energy, uh, memory formation, memory recall, uh, alertness. Um, you know, really what I feel like the best way to describe it is it helps you stay locked on and focused to really tedious and often boring tasks. Um, but just with more enthusiasm, you know, and, and in, in a hunting context, I usually take edge with me when I'm glassing because in Arizona, it's a glassing game and you can sit on, on a hill sometime and spend just hours and hours and hours behind glass. And it just helps you stay freaking locked into those binoculars. Um, and then at ease is, is, is a mood booster. So at ease is really to help your, you know, mind process stressors and, you know, the conditions that actually happen, uh, biologically in your, in your, in your mind that, you know, typically force your mood to turn south. Um, we, you know, and, and the, the point there is like stress obviously is one of the biggest killers of energy. Stress is obviously one of the biggest killers of sleep. Um, so when you're attacking, uh, th these, these pitfalls, uh, and enhancement points in your brain, um, really that's what a nootropic is. It's optimizing the function of your brain, which isn't it, which isn't just in one context, you know, <clears throat> that's, that's a pretty unique system that we've had a lot of success with. We all love the product on a daily basis here. We've got a lot of customers who um, live by these products, but it isn't the most, I would say, unanimously understood and appreciated product, right. you know, because it's a bit on the fringe of what most people are understanding to be useful to them. Um, I think sleep unplug is probably the most popular one because sleep is one of the biggest uh, pain points for people. Um, and if that sounds like you, if anyone's listening to this, if it sounds like you, I think, uh, a lot of people have tried melatonin over the years. The only issue that we have with that is that with prolonged use of melatonin, um, it can be damaging to your, your body's ability to produce it and also produce some other key hormonal, um, components uh, that help you handle stress and, and other things. But, um, you know, melatonin is appropriate in certain contexts for short periods of time. Uh, it tends to be though, like most people, it works and they just become kind of addicted to it. And that's just how they sleep. And that's a slippery slope. Um, you know, unplug really helps your body get into that, uh, condition for sleep. It, it tends to relax blood vessels, uh, relax the mind. Um, it, it, you just, you feel so ready for sleep. You don't get groggy. It's not the type of pill that makes you feel sleepy. There's no sleep aid in it. Um, but when you get to sleep, you, you feel like you're getting good quality sleep. And in a hunting context, for me, it's critical because often you're only getting, I don't know, six hours, four hours. And, and so if I'm going to get any sleep, I wanted to make it count. Um, yeah. So those three products are, are, are kind of some of the more cutting edge ones we've got. Um, one of the ones that we've had for a long time, which continues to be, you know, it's still kind of a seasonal product, but it's, it's very critical is our altitude advantage. Um, for people who live in low country or sea level and go hunting up at, you know, eight to 10,000 feet every year for a week, um, typically they're going to experience some pretty severe altitude sickness. Um, altitude advantage is, is really a remedy for that. You start it prior to ascending up to low oxygen environments. Um, and I actually had the opportunity to test this product. Locally, we had a clinic that was doing a, uh, a research study. The Mayo Clinic was fostering this research study, actually funded by uh, the Navy SEALs. Um, but it was looking at um, the effects of cell um, oxygen saturation at different at different levels. So essentially like where altitude sickness kicks in and how that corresponds to your physical capacity. We got in a bike in a, in a, in a bariatric chamber and simulated different levels of output with different oxygen levels. And it was a pretty fun thing over a couple months, but, um, I was taking altitude advantage the whole time. I did pretty freaking well. Now, I don't know how well I would have done without it, but, um, one of the things altitude advantage does um, truthfully is that, you know, people say, well, do you have a blood oxygenator? Uh, no. And that's an extremely invasive concept. So no, what it does though, is it does prime your body 
to mitigate and manage the stresses that happen uh, when you enter a low oxygen environment. When there's lower oxygen density molecules in the air, um, your body tends to go into a lot of different you know, panic states at, at small levels and big levels. Um, we have a, a ginkgo biloba extract in there with grapeseed extract and ginkgo biloba uh, has been clinically proven to increase red blood cell count um, production. And so we know that to be where a lot of your oxygen molecules are stored. So um, there is a bit of a elevated oxygen uh, molecule production from that, but more so it helps you adapt rapidly. Um, okay. You know, if you go up to 10,000 feet and you have altitude sickness, but you spend a week, you know, by the end of that week, you're going to feel good. Your body's going to adjust. You know, our, our bodies are incredible at adapting to stress and it would eventually get there, but we don't have that kind of time. So we want to prime the body to adapt as quickly as possible. Um, and then one of the other parts of that product, uh, you know, we, we use vitamin C and E and those just help with hypoxia. So just delivering delivering more oxygen to uh, and more fluid to the tissues where sometimes it becomes problematic without oxygen. And um, that's where people maybe have experienced like cramps or just tight joints, stiff muscles when, you know, maybe they don't get sick or headaches, but physically there's a, there's an effect too. So it's, it's invaluable. The hard part about it is not everyone experiences altitude sickness. You know, it, it, right. you know, two guys can go up, they can be from the same town and one guy could get sick and nauseous and throw up. The other guy can be totally fine. And it, it can be really specific to, you know, your physiology. So um, the people who need it, uh, need it so much that they'll pay us an arm and a leg to overnight it into some weird places in Alaska to get it or wherever they're hunting um, because they, they, they don't feel themselves without it. So, right. um, you know, those are some pretty unique ones. I'd say one of the more other unique things is an ingredient we use, uh, Mumio. We use Mumio in all of our pre-workouts and it's a, it's a very rare, um, resin actually. Um, it, it's commonly referred to as shilajit uh, extract. Um, there is only a finite, I mean, it's not a replenished resource in the world. So at some point we're not going to be able to use it anymore when it's not available, but it's really high in folic acid and it has a lot of anabolic properties. And actually, um, years and years and years ago, the, the Soviet Olympic team was the one that really kind of pioneered its research and use in athletic performance. Um, we owe a lot to the Soviet Olympic team. Yeah, we do. <laughs> yeah, we do. Good and bad, but yeah, specifically yeah. with Mumia, with Mumia, we do. And, uh, we, so we use that in all of our pre-workouts and it, you know, it, it does have an effect. We started like, experimenting with just pure Shilajit Mumio and water as a pre-workout, like we bought raw form Mumio and it's not, it's not as, as pure of a form as we're using, but it was the best we could get our hands on in a raw material sense. And when you use that in a little bit of tea, like you just take this resin, put it in a little bit of water and go try to do a pre-workout, no caffeine, no amino acids, nothing. You do feel uh, huh. a bit of a, 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 an uptick in output and energy and just kind of go get them. And uh, it really boils down to the fulvic acid and that's component in, in, in muscle uh, muscle performance and energetics. I'm a little rusty on the science. It's been a while since I've, I've kind of dug into it, but, uh, I remember fulvic acid and humic acid are two pretty critical things with, with muscle physiology, um, fulvic acid being more rare. And, and that's what Mumio is, is really high in and the story behind it, like the, the way it, it's procured is super cool. And I think most outdoorsmen will appreciate it because the way it's formed is it's, it's in Eastern Europe, like Eastern Europe is really where it's formed in these really, really high Alpine uh, mountaintops where there are just trees and a lot of biological matter that is, just, you know, years and years and hundreds of years old that decay over time in these rock formations. And a, a lot of the biological matter tends to gather, um, you know, at the at deep cracks and such deep crevices. And that's where this, this resin begins to form from decaying biological, uh, matter, you know, That's trees, crazy. plants and stuff. And so there's, it's extremely nutrient dense and, um, you know, they found it initially in Russia and that's why the Russians were tapped into it pretty early on. But, um, yeah, that's definitely one of the more unique things that, that we, that we have a, a good source of. That's awesome. Yeah. Tons of great information, man. Um, 
let's wrap things up. How can yep. people, you know, give us a spiel? How can they stay up to date with what's going on at Wilderness Athlete, ac- access the products, yeah. get in touch, all that good stuff? Um, I, well, so the easiest way to get it, stay up to date with all of our product releases and our content is to be on our newsletter. And first and foremost, you sign up for our newsletter and it's not like signing up for spam and a bunch of sh- shit. We're either sending really helpful articles on mental health and how to improve your day, discounts on products or, you know, uh, you know, new product releases, just, you know, enriching information. That's definitely one of going back to our marketing. We try to cut out the static, even like we, we try to make sure everything we put out to people, there's value in it. So our email list, our newsletters is, is the easiest way to get there. If you just go to wildernessathlete.com, um, sign up for our, our email list. Um, our social media is a, usually a pretty good mirror of, of some of the things we're doing uh, with other things too. So, you know, at Wilderness Athlete on Instagram is, is good, but we have an incredible customer service team. Um, so contact us at wildernessathlete.com. You'll always be able to speak with a person um, and you can give us a call anytime and actually, you know, have a conversation with somebody who uses and understands these products. I think that's uh, really helpful for some people when you spend a lot of time on our website, we've got a lot of mm-hmm. products. Maybe you've got some specific needs or things you need to avoid. So yeah, I encourage people not to hesitate to reach out. Um, or you can email me directly. I'm more than happy to help people uh, with anything. So my email is just kevin at Um So there's there's a lot of ways to stay informed of what we're doing. Um, and we we love speaking with you know the community and, and potentially our customers too. So uh, we always hope people don't hesitate to reach out. Oh, that's great. I think there's been a ton of useful information and it's stuff I get questions about all the time. So it's nice to have kind of another objective voice on the podcast to share some experience and, and wisdom. So yeah, yet again, thanks a lot, man. Really appreciate of course. the time. Yeah. I appreciate the opportunity to come on and chat. Hopefully uh, we could do it again sometime. Yeah. would love to. All right. All right. Thanks, Kevin. Thanks, Jay. Cheers. Cheers.